Amen. Well, welcome everyone. Great to have us in the house of the Lord here today. It is the dog days of summer. A lot of people are away traveling, but we look forward to everyone returning. And if you're online, just want to let you know we have a, a place here for you. Come and join us. Well, while we stand up here this morning, we're going to worship the Lord. We are to bring, it says every time we come before the Lord, we're supposed to bring something in our hands. We're supposed to bring some incense, some something that we would dedicate to the Lord and put on the altar of incense and allow that beautiful fragrance to fill our room. Well, we don't have incense, we have worship. We bring worship unto the Lord to fill the house with this beautiful fragrance of worship. So, Father God, is whatever we bring, Lord, we come to dedicate it to you, to worship you, to lift our voices to you. God, fill this room with beautiful incense of the praises of your people. God, we want to worship you and dedicate our lives to you and say, God, you alone are worthy this morning. You alone are worthy of all that we can bring. So, God, enjoy the praises, Lord, that we bring to you. Let's worship the Lord.
turn graves. stop working never stop never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop never stop working never stop never stop working even when i don't feel it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working never stop never stop working Never stop, never stop, you are way make a miracle work. Promise keep a light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Cause you are way make a miracle work. Promise keep a light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you 
promise keep a light in the darkness my god that is who you are as you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are god we thank you that that is who you are you provide for us in so many ways and we just lift up a, a song of worship and praise to you that, um, Jesus, we love you. We worship you. We adore you. We exalt you. We, we want to honor you, Lord, that um, we thank you that we were able to gather together today and worship and um, just learn about you and dig in deep. We pray for um, change in our hearts, Lord, as we not only hear the sermon today, but we also, as we go out in our weeks, that we would continually be ingrained in your word and worship in you and prayer. Um, yeah, Jesus, we love you.
affection, our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus, our affection, our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus, our affection, our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus. We love you. Oh, how we love you. You are, you are the one I There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of love where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord no Your glory 
hearts long for to be overcome by your presence, Lord, Spirit, you are welcome here. Come plant this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence. on the day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago the Holy Spirit was poured out it says that there were tongues of fire there was a wind blowing a mighty rushing wind and it says everyone everyone was affected by the presence of God because they hungered for the presence they longed for the presence Father that's us today Lord we long for the presence of God God we pray right now Lord that there would be a move in this house 
like the days of old, days of Pentecost, Lord, that there would be a fire that would rest on us, Lord. There would be a fire that would burn in us. There would be something, oh Lord, that would rise up in us. Oh God, there is something of the presence of God that stirs us, awakens us, charges us, moves us, oh Lord. Songs begin to be sung, oh God. God, gifts begin to be released. Lord, there's something that comes when the presence of God meets His people who are hungry for You, Lord. We're hungry for You, Lord. We want You, Lord. Come, we welcome You and say, fill this house, fill this place, fill every home, every heart, every marriage, every family, Lord, with Your presence. And because, God, we're changed. God, we're changed when the presence comes in. So, God, we pray today, Lord, leave a lasting impression by Your presence, God, in every heart and every life. Fill us up, Lord. God, I thank You today, Lord, that You come to minister to every heart, every life. You want to leave no one out. So, God, whether it's a healing, whether it's an encouragement, whether it's a strength, whether it's a revelation, God, come and meet every person and every heart in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. Great to be in the house. Man, it's a good thing you didn't stay home because you're going to miss something. I'm sure of it. Uh, But we're here today. Why don't we take a couple minutes and welcome one another here, and then we'll come back with some announcements. It's great to have Megan Canal back with us. Long journey on a little holiday, but great to have you with us, Megan.
All right. Well, let's, uh, let's all make our way back to our um, seats. We're going to get started with some, uh, some announcements here this morning. Great to have everyone here. I want to just speak to a couple important announcements. Last Sunday, we took up a... Took up an offering uh, last Sunday for uh, Cheryl Matson. She's here with us today, and her grandchildren are on their way at, at a camp enjoying a, a summer. But uh, I trust that uh, we're all praying for her and her family. I've, uh, they had a fire in their basement. Uh, they've been moved around a number of places. It looks like they do have a place coming up here uh, this week that they're going to be able to be situated in for at least some time of permanency. But uh, we did last Sunday take up an offering for her, and uh, I, I appreciate those that did. And I want to just encourage uh, anyone and everyone, um, I'll tell you what, whatever you give will bless you as much as it blesses her. It is a principle of stewardship and generosity, whether it's $5, $10, $20, for some $1,000, whatever it is that you give. Um, I believe as a family we should all be shoring up one another. So I just want to encourage you again, uh, whether it's, again, $5, $10, what you're doing is you're saying, I'm standing with you. And your finances are coming in to bless, but also it is coming by a spirit of generosity that God responds to. God is a debtor to no one. And I just want to encourage you, get on the Planning Center app. Uh, you do see uh, there is a QR code that is up here right now. It takes nothing to quickly get on there and just say, hey, I'm part of the family. And if you're online, you have opportunity and, can I say, also responsibility as part of the family of God to help one another. So young adults all the way through, and, and I, I so bless uh, those that have already given, uh, continue to do so, and we are there for her. We'll need uh, furniture and opportunities to provide them some of the other solid goods when the time comes. So um, just, just make note of that. And then it's just our regular giving, our tithes and our offerings. What we're doing here is called alms. We are supporting those that are in need, but our tithes and offerings go to the house of God. And I encourage you to continue in the areas of your tithes and offerings. Uh, God responds to this principle in your finances. He blesses. He walks alongside of us in our finances when we release our finances to him in the areas of tithes and offerings. So God bless you with that. Uh, the 20th, we are having our church barbecue. Come on. Uh, we're going to have burgers, uh, cheeseburgers, and regular burgers, and double burgers. And for those that want it, they're going to be triple burgers. And, uh, um, but we also want to give opportunity, as we've done in the past, for people to bring salads and desserts. Uh, you can sign up today. We do need you to sign up just so that we know who's coming. And Claudia over here just raised her hand. She's over there. She'll be at the coffee area. Uh, you can sign up there and let us know that you're coming and that you're going to be bringing something. So uh, we're looking forward to that. On the 20th, there is also uh, every year there is a Edmonton Marathon going on. And um, we're not running in it. <sighs> All right. Uh, but what it is is an opportunity uh, just to be aware of, especially 102 Avenue through the downtown, there are closures or delays. So when you do come through, uh, 142 Street, 136th Street is open, 107th Avenue is open. Um, they don't really affect, uh, Grote Road isn't affected at all. So uh, just be aware of it and uh, plan accordingly because we don't want you to miss the house of God and the barbecue that is taking place. Uh, so we look forward to that. Young adults, what are we doing here, Ben? We're, we're meeting here in the, in the, in the school uh, in the school. Uh, Bible study area. So young adults, come on out, be a part of that. I know summer is a time we just like to enjoy, uh, sometimes just hanging out by ourselves. But you know, the body of Christ, we just need one another. And it's a great way to do life together. So with that, uh, we're going to move on into the Word of God. Open up our Bibles. And you say, well, where can I open them up to? Well, I will tell you, open it up to your favorite book, the book of Leviticus. All right. But before we get there, <laughs> Pastor, you're in the book of Leviticus? Absolutely. It is one of my favorite books. But anyway, we're on Let Me Introduce Myself. This is God speaking, and he's trying to reveal himself to you and I that we would get this revelation of who he is in his fullness. And his names help us understand who he is. 
Now, I know, I, I am thoroughly enjoying, once again, I've done this before, but just going through the study of the names of God is just exhilarating. I'm excited about it. And I know many of you are because you've told me. You said, hey, thank you. Pastor Jeff, we're enjoying going through the names and what, uh, learning more about God. And um, I believe that's many of you, though you uh, maybe have not told me so. But uh, uh, I enjoy, uh, even as uh, during prayer, you know, people acknowledge. And uh, when I'm preaching uh, and I hear people go, uh-huh, that's right. Preach it, Pastor. This is good. You're on fire. Whatever you want to do. Um, it just uh, encourages me that you're number one listening. Number two, that you're agreeing with me. And number three, you might be waking up the person next to you. Just saying, all right? So don't be afraid to be a little vocal when the preaching is happening, whoever it is. And uh, I so appreciate you guys uh, receiving Pastor uh, Len Rotten, Len and Lori. Uh, last uh, uh, Sunday when I was away and they came and ministered, I know a word of encouragement and they uh, blessed you. So thank you for receiving them. They are great friends and come with a strong word of the Lord. But seriously, the names of God, they are great. They are wonderful um, you know, Proverbs tells us that the name of the Lord is a high tower and the righteous run into it and are safe. The, the name of God is a high tower. And when we get the names of God, we find a place inside the name, the provision, the character, the nature of God. And we can find safety. We can find provision. And uh, I, I just thank you that, you know, God at times he reveals himself. This is who I am. And other times it's people by their experience with God that they dedicate a, an altar, they build an altar, they reveal something about God's character, and it's written for us in Scripture that we get to know. But every time we look at a name, just like you would in your own personal relationships, when you hear another title or another name of somebody, generally it pulls you into them to know a little bit more about them, whether they are uh, a husband or uh, a wife or a father or a mother, or they are of a business realm, a CEO or, or some other doctor or PhD or something. All of a sudden, you get a glimpse into them, but then you also get a glimpse into some of their nature and character. And this is what God wants, is to you and I get closer to him. Get closer to him. He reveals his name for a reason, to become more intimate with him and to be able to lean on him. Just very quickly, we saw that, first of all, out of Exodus, that his name is Jehovah. He is I am that I am. This is the personal name of God. God says, this is who I am, Yahweh. I want a personal relationship with you. I am that I am simply means that everything you have need of, I am that. I have whatever it is you have need of. Come, come to me. Come into a relationship with me. We saw that he's Jehovah Jireh. There on, on the mountain of Moriah there that, that uh, Abraham goes to sacrifice his son and without a sacrificial lamb, his son was going to be the one that dies. But oh, God, in the midst of the moment, he provides a, a sacrifice. And Jehovah Jireh is the God that in the time when there's all of a sudden running out of time, no provision, no availability, God shows up. He is our provider. Whether it's provision for healing and strength and direction, whatever you have need of, he is our provider. And we know that the ultimate provision is Jesus Christ because when there was no sacrifice for our sins, we would have to die ourselves. That at the last minute, it's as if God said, no, my son will die for you. He provided a lamb in the midst of all uh, the sin and iniquity of our lives. Jehovah Nissi, the Lord is our banner. He's our victory. Then just like Moses saw that when Joshua was fighting with the sword of the Lord, dealing with the enemies, this victory is found in the heights of the mountain, calling on God, hands raised up, the staff lifted to God, Aaron and Ur coming alongside to hold it up because the victory is found in the things of God, the ways of God, the, the realms of God. It's spiritual warfare. And we know that God is for us. Hands up, we advance. Hands down, it says the enemy advanced. So we have Jesus who is our ultimate banner and our victory. Jehovah Sid Canu, the Lord, our righteousness. We in ourselves, our righteousness is as filthy rags. God has a standard. It's unbendable. It, it is uh, uh, unshakable. It is a standard, but we fall short. Our righteousness is filthy rags. We can never meet his standard. So what are we to do? We receive the righteousness of Christ. He who knew no sin became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. Christ becomes our righteousness, and therefore we can have a relationship with God. 
Lastly was Jehovah Shalom. He is our peace. And it simply talks about us being in a completeness, a wholeness. Uh, not just the avoidance of conflict. It is the pointing to something else. And that something else that we're missing is Jesus Christ. Isaiah 9, 6 says that he is the Prince of Peace. Jesus says that my peace I give you. I leave it with you, not as the world gives. I give a peace that's different. It passes all understanding. It's a peace that in the midst of conflict and chaos and struggle and difficulties and drama of life, we can have a peace on the inside because our peace isn't dependent on the outside. It's dependent on who's on the inside of us, Jesus. And as long as we've got Jesus on the inside, we've got his peace, Jehovah Shalom. Well, today's about holiness the Lord who sanctifies. The Lord who sanctifies. We're talking about something called holiness. Now, often we look at holiness and we begin to fear and tremble or we have misconceptions about it. We feel that it's going to be dogmatic. It's going to be a push down, a, a thrust upon us. It's going to be rules and all these kind of things. But that's not what holiness is all about. Holiness is actually a, a remarkable invitation to come into a beautiful relationship with the Lord. Holiness, to be holy, is to simply to be set apart. It means to be uncommon. Well, God, he is set apart. He's uncommon. He's high and lifted up. There's no one else like him. Holiness speaks of his otherness. He's nothing like anything else. He's other than. He stands apart from anything else. But it also speaks of his moral character. It talks about his absolute moral purity. He is perfectly good and, and everything. He is the source and standard of all that is good. This is God. He is holy. And he's not just holy. Scripture says he's not just holy, holy. Scripture says he's holy, holy, holy. The seraphims around the throne of God, Isaiah 6, they're calling out. It's holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy is he. We find it in the book of, of Revelation, this holiness of God captures all of heaven. We look and say, well, what is the greatest attribute of God that we, we just, man, we just can't, oh, we just want it so much. Well, it's God's love. Nowhere in the Bible does it say love, love, love. You got to go to a Beatles song to find that. <laughs> Everything else is all singular. His goodness, his kindness, his grace, his justice, his mercy. Everything about God, even his love. He is love, but you know what? They don't sing, oh, love, love, love. Everybody, love, love, you know, that's not it. It's holy, holy, holy with reverence, with awe, with bowing down. It is, God is holy. He is holy, thrice holy. For God, to, and you think of this, you think of this. If, if God loved you, but you didn't have holiness, but his love was bigger than holiness, then the love that God would have for us would actually be common love. Because what sets apart his love for us that makes it so remarkable? It's his holiness. That God who is so holy, he's so perfect, he's so morally, imp morally pure, everything about him is holy, holy, uncommon, set apart, nobody's like him, and yet he loves us. Who's not holy? That we're broken. There were unholy we make mistakes we're impure we're, we're attitudes our thoughts god we're, we're so far from being holy and yet you in your holiness you love us you have justice towards us, mercy towards us, kindness towards us. everything about god everything about god flows out of the standard of his holiness so we want to know his holiness we want to understand how holy he is we don't fear it. We, we don't run from it. We invite the understanding of his holiness. It's his holiness that gives weight and value to everything about his character and his nature. And maybe this has become what's missing to some degree in the church today. Because with holiness comes reverence. With holiness comes the fear, not of judgment, but the fear of his presence that he being so holy and I'm not. That holiness causes us to walk in a desire to be in a standard of rightness with God. Because he's so holy. God, how can I have this relationship with you? That we don't take it casual. 
We don't take it flippantly. We don't take it like, boy, he's just my homeboy. You know? That's not who Jesus is. He's holy. He's God. The Son of God. That all of heaven bows down, casts their thrones, their, their crowns down, and begins to worship the Lamb. We call God, you're holy. Like Isaiah, when he came into the presence of God, you see, holiness is attractive, but it's also dangerous. Isaiah goes into the presence of God in Isaiah 6, and he sees the, the glory of God. It, it, it's the the, the uh, train of his glory is filling the temple. It's like we don't have God in here. We just have all of this glory because the train of his glory, of his robe, fills everything. And all of a sudden, he looks at that, and the door frames begin to shake. The seraphims begin to cry out, holy, holy, holy. And all of a sudden, he looks, and he sees the holiness of God, and he sees his unholiness. And he says, woe is me. I'm a man undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. He says, my words can't even be before God. God takes a seraphim with a coal under, from under the altar and purifies his lips so he can stand before God and answer when he says, who will I send? And Isaiah could say, I send me. But it's attractive. It's like I can't wait to be in the holiness of God, but I don't deserve it. What, if I, what will I do? What happened to Moses? Moses said, I want to see your glory. Can I see your glory? And God says, you can't, but I'll let you just a rock right here. I'll carve out a place, put my hand there to protect you because you can't see all of me. But I'll, I'll pass by and you can see the backside of me because nobody can see me and live. See, the holiness of God is attractive, but it's dangerous. What are we to do? What are we to do when God calls us into his presence? And this is when we come to this thing called Jehovah Mekadesh, which simply means the Lord, our sanctifier. He's the Lord who sanctifies us. To sanctify means to set apart. To sanctify means to set apart, make uncommon, to dedicate something for God's own pleasure. It's for God, not for anything else. So you can have anything, you can do anything in life. You can purchase anything. It's common. But when all of a sudden God dedicates it and consecrates it to himself, it becomes holy, like the temple. The temple is just a building until God says, no, that's mine, and I consecrate it for me, my presence. It became holy. We find the high priest became holy because God dedicated, consecrated it to himself. The tribe of Levi, the Levites, in place of the firstborn, he says, I'll consecrate the tribe of Levi, the Levites, and they will be holy to me, dedicated to me. They were consecrated. The parts of the temple, you think of the incense it was, and the anointing oil that was made by man, but God says it's a certain way. And if anybody makes it for themselves, all of a sudden, you'll be judged because it's consecrated to me. It's for me. Throughout the Old Testament, God was constantly weaving his people to become his people. The nation of Israel, God set out to bring them together, distinct from the nations. He says, here's Israel. Out of, out of Abraham comes this nation. And this nation is going to be dedicated, consecrated to me so that it's different than everybody else. Exodus 19, verse 5 and 6 says this, Now therefore, if you'll indeed obey my voice and keep my commandment or my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure. Hear these words. God's saying, I'm going to make you a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, and these are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. He calls them separated. He says, you're sanctified. You're a special treasure. Growing up, I had a bag of marbles. I loved taking the bag of marbles to school. Those bag of marbles, man, I would win some, I would lose some, but I would never bring out my special marbles because I didn't want to lose them. 
They were my special marbles. I hid them. I wouldn't take them to be with the common because people would say, hey, can I have that one? Can let's trade let's... No, these are my special treasure. And God says the same thing about us. He makes us, some of us, more marbly than others, all right? Losing your marbles maybe, but we're special. We're his treasure. I want you to be different. When God's people went into Egyptian captivity for 400 years, they were immersed in the immorality and the idolatry of a nation that didn't serve a holy God. There were cultural practice, societal uh, demands and behaviors that were imposed on them. So what does God do? God brings them out, then he sets rules, regulations to show they're separate, follow these rules, and what's going to happen is these rules will break you from the old influences, and these rules will keep you when you go into the promised land from becoming like them. He says, I want to make you separate. I want to make you distinct. Leviticus 18.1 says this, The Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites, say to them, I am the Lord your God. You must not do as they do in Egypt, your past, where you used to live, and you must not do as they do in the land of Canaan where I'm bringing you. Don't follow their practices. You must obey my laws and be careful to follow my decrees. I am the Lord your God. God calls us out and he says, stop doing what you used to do, hello. And he says, now these rules are to help you from doing what they're doing when you go live with them. You're different. You're sanctified. You're separate. You're not like everybody else. And I know Leviticus, your favorite book, just chapter 17 to 20. We ain't going to read it. Whew, got you past that one. But it gives directions for the nation of Israel before going into the promised land. It's just reminding them of how bad it's going to be over there, and I want you not to be like them. He gives these directions in legal matters, personal matters, civic matters, behaviors, actions, all with the emphasis. It's all about being separate, being not like everybody else. In these chapters, God command, gives commands like this. Number one, he puts this in, he repeats this twice. Do not sacrifice your children on the fires of Moloch. See, in the world, they're sacrificing their children. Hello? They're taking newborns, unborns, children, throwing them in the fire as a way to appease their gods. We, what do we got today besides, you know, we look at the abortion. We look at children. We look at the sex trade. We look at so many things happening to our generation because the enemy wants to get the next generation. So God says, don't do that. And then he says, stay away from all forms of immorality. Men with men, women with women, with beasts. Get rid of all the junk that's going on in the world today. Even though they say it's legal, it doesn't mean it's moral. He says, don't be like them. Don't buy into it. Stay away from witchcraft and mediums. Stay away from cheating, lying. Everything that the world is doing, don't be like them. Stay generous. Believe it or not, Leviticus 19 says stay generous. Live with an open hand. Tend to the poor. Look after those in need. And then he says, protecting one another. Live in unity. Leviticus 19, guess what is in there? Love your neighbor as yourself. Did you know that that's where it came from? Jesus was quoting, love your neighbor as yourself, out of Leviticus 19. Let me just run these through to you. I'm just going to, they're on the screen, but let me just read this really quickly. This happens four times. <coughs> Leviticus 19.1. Lord said to Moses, speak to the entire assembly of Israel, say to them, be holy because I, the Lord, your God, am holy. Leviticus 20, verse 7 and 8. Consecrate yourselves and be holy because I'm the Lord, your God. Keep my decrees and follow them. I am the Lord who makes you holy. Leviticus 21, 24. But I said to you, you will possess the land and I will give it to you as an inheritance, a land flowing with milk and honey. I'm the Lord, your God, who has set you apart from the nations. Leviticus 21, you are to be holy to me because I, the Lord, am holy, and I have set you apart from the nations to be my own. Do you see something happening? God says, you're mine. I'm setting you apart. I'm holy. Be holy. Together we can have this holiness thing going on where we're living a different kind of life. He makes us holy. He consecrates us. But then he says live a life that's holy. He puts the responsibility back on us that we're to live a holy life. How? How do we do this? How does this happen? Well, first, we're positionally holy through Jesus Christ. It's by grace. By grace, we are saved through faith, not, not, of, not of works, least any man should boast. We've got nothing to do with this. Christ 
makes us holy by his death, burial, and resurrection. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 8. First, Christ said, You did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings or burnt offerings or the offerings for sin, nor were you pleased with them. He's talking to the Father. He says, You know, when I came, you didn't want those things going on anymore. He says, Though they were required by the law of Moses. Then Jesus said, Look, I have come to do your will. And it says, He cancels the first covenant, the law of Moses, in order to put in the second into effect. For God's will was to make us to be made holy. How? By the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. We're made holy when we come to God through Jesus Christ. His death brings holiness to us. We have nothing to do with being holy in relationship to God. He makes us holy. I am the Lord that sanctifies you. And through Christ we find, through this amazing truth, His sacrifice, we're made holy, broken, evil, wicked. Come on, we're sinners. We don't deserve God's grace. We, we are unholy of unholy. And yet God says, I choose you and I make you holy because of Jesus Christ. You've got nothing to do with it. You're positionally made holy because of what I did through my Son positionally, saved and sanctified, made holy. 1 Peter 2.9, he picks up the language of the Old Testament that we've been reading, and he says this, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. That's coming up right out of Leviticus. Now it's by Christ and what he's done that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You're chosen. Through Christ now, you're a special, you're the special marbles in the bag. Think about it. Come on. He holds on to you. You're special. You, God says, you're mine. I've called you. I've sanctified you. And he goes on. He says, verse 15, but just as he who called you is holy now, so be holy in all you do. You're holy. You're called to be holy, chosen to be holy, sanctified to be holy. God takes responsibility for your holiness positionally with God, but then he commands us to be holy. 1 Peter 1.13 says, Therefore, with minds that are alert and, full of soul, and fully sober, set your heart on the grace, the provision, to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As sober children, do not be conformed to the evil desires that you had when you lived in ignorance. He's talking about us before Christ. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it's written, be holy because I'm holy. Positionally, we are holy through Christ. But in process, we're made holy by decisions that we make. We are to live a holy life. We're to live as those that are holy and chosen and consecrated, and to live that out in our lives, in our daily lives, through Christ. It's a joint work with our desire and his empowerment. Like the nation of old of Israel, you think about all the nations that were around them. They were living in the midst of ungodly, unholy territory. There were different gods, different idolatry. There was different practices, different uh, situations going on that they lived amongst all that. And they were led at many times to adopt those things, and God would come in and judge. They would adopt again. God would come in and judge. And God was always bringing them back, bringing them back, bringing them back. The Bible terms that thing that's around us, it calls it worldliness. Nowhere are we to come out of the world. We're to stay in the world, but we're to keep the worldliness outside. We're to be separated to God in the midst of all that is holy, this world, this culture, this way of life. And this is what John, how John writes it in 1 John chapter 1, verse 15. Do not love the Lord, or do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. Listen to this. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. As believers... We are separated to God, which means the world's standards are not our standards. 
The world's perspective is not our perspective. We have a biblical world view, not a cultural world view. We don't see the world as the world sees it. We see the world as God sees it. So we hold up the word. We hold up God's ways. And we say, does it match what God says? And if it is not, then we say, that's not the way I'm going. I'm separate from what the world says. I only want what God says. John 15, this is what Jesus prays. John 17, verse 15. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. God, Jesus says right away, you're not of the world. If you are a believer, you're not of the world. You're of the kingdom of God. You're of a different world. And then he says, I'm praying not to take you out of the world. You've got to be in the world because we're lights. Come on, we're a city set on a hill. We're lights. We are a lamp to shine. We're salt, but he says, I know what, but I, what I want to do is protect them. Keep them from the evil, from the ungodly, the unholy. Jesus right now is praying for you to be separate from the world. The world's thinking, the world's attitudes, the world's... He is up there praying. He's our high priest praying for us right now. He's on our side. How are we to be holy? It's a privilege to be made holy, but it's our responsibility to walk in holiness. 1 Peter 2.9, remember we read this. It says, for you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's possession, that you. There's a purpose behind being made holy. The reason God made you holy is not so God can put you up on a shelf and say, look at my holiness. In this person, this no, no. He says, you are to live a holy life, it says, so that you might declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You're walking amidst the world right now declaring his praises. Can they see it? Can they notice that you're different than them? Is there something about you, your life, your decision, your choices, that people say, what's different about, there's something different about you. And when they get to the bottom of it, what's happening is you're declaring the praises of him who called you out of darkness. We are called to be holy. The purpose of declaring. He called us, chose us, broken. Man, some of us, most of us, all of us, we came to Jesus messed up. What do we have in us that God would say, you're worthy of my holiness, Nothing. But because he's so holy, he chooses us in our brokenness, and he makes us holy. He calls us to be with him into a holy heaven. Think about that. God, you're making a way for me to be with you. You're so holy, and I'm not, but you make me holy, and now you want me to live holy and ultimately live on a mission that's holy, telling other people about you. Why? So that I can live with you in this eternity, in holiness, in this holy realm. Because he's chosen me, out of his great love towards me, I don't deserve it. But I don't live out of fear now. I don't live out of fear of that holiness. I live out of desire to want to be holy like him. I want to be like him. If I could possibly somehow be more like Christ who's holy then God, you called me into this realm. God, what can I do? I want to do it. I'm passionate. I, I want to be more like you. I, I can't believe you would make me holy. So God, I want to spend my life living the way you call me. How do we do that? Let me give you four real quick thoughts as we come to a bit of a close. Number one, live a sanctified life, a separated, sacrificed life. We know this, Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Live on purpose. And the purpose is, Lord, I want to be holy. God, everything I want to do, everything I want to think about, everything I, I put my hands to, everything I get involved in, God, I want to be holy, which simply means I'm distinct from the world. I'm not common like the world. I'm different than the world. 
It doesn't mean I'm weird. It just means my values are different. My core is different. What I want is different. We daily offer our body, our mind, our emotions. How? Fully to God. Like a burnt offering, we say, God, it's all yours. We lay it down every morning and every night on the altar and say, God, I yield it to you. Take all that I am. The world wants to conform us. And you know what holiness is? It's, listen to me, holiness is simply resisting the squeeze. Resist the squeeze. The holy world wants to conform us into their thinking, into their attitudes, into their behaviors, into their all their situations. What do we holiness is resisting the squeeze, saying, I will not be squeezed to becoming like the world. I'm gonna live like Christ. I'm gonna be different, uncommon. I'm gonna be separate to the ways of God. I resist the squeeze. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, Do you not know the body? Your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you receive from God. You are not your own. You are bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. We resist the squeeze. I, my body, my mind, my soul, everything about me belongs to God. He owns it. He bought it. He purchased it. It's separated to God in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So anything that would defile who I am, in my fullness, we go, no, I resist. I resist the squeeze. I'm not going to go there, do that. I'm not going to abide by their behaviors and their actions. No, I'm going to be what God calls me to be. Number two, live in a life in alignment with God's holy word. You know these passages. I didn't put them up. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us and we have seen his glory, the glory of his one and only son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Jesus is the word. The word is Jesus. The word, logos, the word of rhema, the prophetic release, the word is God. John, uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, every, all scriptures given what? By inspiration, it's God breathed. Men of old were moved over, moved on by the Holy Spirit and brought these scriptures forth. The word is holy. So we take the scriptures in and they renew our minds. They touch our spirit. All of a sudden we hide the word of God in our heart that we might not sin against God. What is that? Resisting the squeeze. We allow the word of God to to well up on in the inside of us. We begin to use it as a sword. What are we doing? We are giving our lives to the holiness of God through Scripture. And it transforms us. It builds into us the ways of God. John 17, verse 17. Jesus said, sanctify them, set them apart by your truth, and your word is truth. The Word of God becomes a light, a lamp, a sword. There's so many things. It becomes a hammer. It is so, it's like a Swiss army knife to the Spirit. If you know what a Swiss army knife is, it's got a knife for every occasion. Well, the Word of God's got something for every occasion. But you got to read it, memorize it, put it in your heart. Eat the Word of God, like Jeremiah said, and it becomes your joy and rejoicing. Number three. So we got to... <clears throat> Live a sacrifice life. Live in alignment to God's word. Number three, you let the Sabbath and worship set you apart. In Genesis, when he created the heavens and earth, he did it, we know, in six days, and the seventh day he rested. All the days were equal. They're all, they're all just days. They were good, 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 good. Six days, they were good. Then in the seventh, he says, it's not good. He says he made it holy. Genesis 2, 3. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from the work of creating all that he had created. When you come to church, and if you're online, come to church, worship God. Let me tell you why. When you're giving your time, your energy, your resources into the community, you are separating yourself from the world. You're saying this one day is God's day. The Sabbath day is God's day, and I separate it in my life and make it different in me. And that sets you apart from this world. Because the world says, oh, no, no, no. What are you doing going to church on Sunday? You need to go on holidays. You need to rest. You need to do what you want to do. You're you're serving in the house of God. You work six days, five days of the week, maybe six, and now you're serving in the house of God. You're giving your finances to the house of God. You're tithing. You're giving. And the world says, why would you do that? You do, you know why? Because I belong to God. I don't belong to the world. 
See, we either pursue after godliness or we pursue after worldliness. You can't have both. God says, no, pursue after the Sabbath. Pursue it. When you give all these things to God, you know what you're doing? Is you're making sure Jesus is on the throne and nobody else is sharing the throne with him. You're recalibrating. I belong to Jesus. He's on the throne of my life. Well, he's on the throne, but you know what? Squished in there, there kind of probably get three or four people on that throne because it's a pretty wide throne. So I got Jesus, I got my work, I got my recreation, and I got my, my finances. You know, they're sort of all equal. Coming on Sundays, make sure it's Jesus on the throne and him alone. You recalibrate. You remember that you belong to him and everything else belongs to him. Fourthly, you pursue holiness. You want to live a holy life. I don't have to. I get to. It says in Hebrews chapter 12, 14, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. I want holiness because I want to see the Lord. I want holiness. I want to feel his presence. I want holiness because it changes me, my marriage, my family. It changes everything. I don't have to pursue holiness. I get to. I want to. I want to get to the house. I want to get into the word. I want to get into worship. And I want to be in the house because guess what's in the house? Saints. What are saints? Separated ones. We rub shoulders with saints, with holy people. We get to be like each other and help each other. That's the house of God, the family. Lastly, lean on the Holy Spirit. I don't know if you've noticed, but he's called Holy Spirit. There's something about the Holy Spirit that helps make us be holy. Because we can't do it, we need him. We need him constantly to be filled with the Spirit. Filled up, pursuing after, walking in the Spirit. He comes to teach you, to comfort you, to lead you, to guide you, to, to open up your life, to be more like God. How does that happen? We welcome Holy Spirit every day. Holy Spirit, come, give me what I need today. We're called and chosen to be holy. He's called holy for a reason. We serve a holy God. We pursue a holy God. We obey a holy God. I don't want what the world has to offer. I want what God has to offer. Say, God, take it all away. Whatever the world has to offer me, take it away if it distracts me from you. I want God and what he has for me. That means I need to pursue holiness. Everything the world has pales comparison to the riches of his love, the depth of his mercy, the joy of his countenance, everything pales. Without holiness, we won't see the Lord. Today, tomorrow, eternity. We serve a holy God that has a holy intent to make holy people, to walk on a holy mission, and to live with him in a holy heaven. Holiness is paramount. And how many would say amen to that this morning? Pursue holiness. Love holiness. Live a life of holiness and depend upon the Holy Spirit. Let's stand here. Father, as we come, as we close here today, Lord, we need your Holy Spirit. God, we can't make ourselves holy. You make us holy. But we can respond in obedience to live a holy life. Whether we're young or old, children or adults, God, we never can pursue enough holiness, make it enough of a goal, a desire, a passion. Lord, I pray today you would quicken in us this desire to be holy. God, not because it's a thing we have to do. It's a duty. It's a devotion. We want holiness in our minds, in our souls, in our bodies. We want holiness in how we walk in this earth, oh Lord. Let it be attractive to people. We're not pious. We're not self-made holy. We're humbly shaped holy by your presence. So, Lord, we yield our lives to you. We say, come, Holy Spirit. We welcome you today. Open up your lives to the Lord here. 
Let's worship him. Let's renew our lives in that pursuit of holiness and allow God to touch you as we come to this end of this close.
blazing fill the atmosphere your glory god is what our hearts long to be overcome by your presence Lord. amen you know, i really believe that we're in a world today that is there it's constantly moving pressing it is squeezing us and I, I believe for some when you heard resist the squeeze that you go I'm having a hard time doing that so father I pray for those young and old right now that are having a hard time resisting the squeeze the world that is squeezing trying to conform us in our thoughts and our attitudes whether it's at school or at work or in relationships they're, they're, they're asking us to uh, compromise to give in our belief systems, to water down what we used to think was true. God, I pray by the Holy Spirit that there would come a strength in them, a, a steel in their backbone. God, that there would be a standing and unshakableness in them, that they will resist the squeeze in the name of Jesus. God, that they will not be moved. God, what they, the standards, the understandings, the principles, the morality, God, areas of life, oh God, that they will not be shaken and moved, oh Lord, but they would pursue after holiness with a fervency, with a righteousness, oh God, with a desire, oh Lord, to please you, not because, oh God, they can be make themselves holy, but you make them holy. God, you made us holy. We want now to walk out a holy life. God, I pray for every person, young and old. Give them the strength they need, oh God. God, give them the strength they need. In Jesus' name, well, Holy Spirit, we welcome you to come into our hearts. Fill us up. Guide us through this in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, isn't it beautiful how the Lord calls us into these aspects of who he is? We go, thank you, Lord. You are the Lord who sanctifies me. What a beautiful, beautiful. Hey, sign up today. Uh, don't forget about the uh, barbecue coming up on the 20th. So that's next Sunday. We need to know so we can make provision for everybody. And uh, uh, look forward to having you. And if you're online, please be here on the 20th. We can't wait to see you. Um, hey, that's it. God bless you. Have a great weekend. And uh, we'll see you uh, next week. Young adults on Thursday. God bless you.